Welcome to the New to Jesus podcast, where we find foundational truths to help you take your first steps in your walk with Christ. Welcome back to the New to Jesus podcast. I'm Dan Bergman, and in this episode, we're going to look at John chapter 2. In chapter 1, we've seen the doctrine of Christ's preexistence, his deity, that he is the creator, life and light of men, and that John the Baptist was his witness bearer. We've also seen Jesus call his first disciples. In chapter 2, we're going to see his first miracle, his first public miracle at the wedding in Cana. And we'll see the first Passover also of Jesus' earthly ministry. So let's get right into it. In John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. When it says the third day, it's referring to the sequence of days beginning when John was questioned by those from Judea. And so these things are happening very quickly in the book of John. Now, Cana, in the north of Israel, kind of on the west of the Sea of Galilee, is the area where this wedding was to take place. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So they were there, they were invited to the wedding. In verse 3, it says, and when they wanted wine, meaning when they lacked wine, it doesn't mean that like, you know, this is the point where we want some wine, Jesus. This is saying that they were out of wine, that they lacked wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. And this is interesting because um, the word wine can sometimes mean different things. Remember how I said that the New Testament was written in Greek. So it wasn't originally written in English. The Greek word oinos, translated wine, is not necessarily alcoholic, but it's also the word used for the fruit of the vine, meaning grape juice. Context can determine which usage is correct. Also, due to the absence of the modern distilling process that we have today, The strength of biblical alcohol was, by modern standards, very weak. It was also generally greatly diluted with water. So, technically, and when we think about passages uh, talking about, you know, should we drink or not? Should Christians drink alcohol? Should Christians drink beer? Personally, my opinion, based on scripture, is that we should not. Um, Biblically, there's this idea of strong drink. Give strong drink to him that is ready to die. It's kind of like the biblical morphine, okay? It was like their painkiller medicine for somebody that was in extreme pain was strong drink. Now, we think of strong drink today as like hard liquor or whiskey, stuff like that. The world today doesn't look at things like beer and and, and wine as, as strong drink, but technically... All modern alcoholic beverages would be equal to or greater than biblical strong drink. Meaning, I don't think we should be drinking those things. The Bible calls wine a mocker in in the book of Proverbs. Jesus saith unto her, Jesus' response to Mary when she says, They have no wine. Jesus says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now, a couple of things about this passage. When Jesus says, mine hour, my hour is not yet come, my time is not yet, it's almost always specifically in reference to his death. And so this would start things moving. This would get the ball rolling as far as Jesus being publicly known as the Messiah, which would lead to his accusation and his subsequent crucifixion. And so he says to her, my, my, my time is not yet. My hour is not yet come. When he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? There's no disrespect meant here. The same word is used in an endearing way in the end of the book of John, when Jesus is on the cross, and he refers to Mary as woman. The phrase, what do I have to do with thee, 
is of Hebrew origin, and it's seen numerous times in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. The Hebrew phrase, mali valach, what to me and to you is used in the books of Judges and Samuel. And it basically means this. What in the world does that have to do with you and me? It's kind of funny the way that Jesus responds. Yeah, they have no wine. What, what does that have anything to do with me? <laughs> you know, talking to Mary, his mother. It's kind of a res- restrained rebuke. Speaking of Jesus's hour, it's certainly a general reference to his public messiahship, but always has a bold, specific reference to his death on the cross. We see this in John 7, John 8, John 13, Matthew 26, and Mark 14. In John chapter 12, Jesus answers them and says, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now my soul is troubled, And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And so Jesus' hour is a specific reference to his death on the cross. Verse number five, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I like to share this verse with my Catholic friends and family members. This is the one time in all of the Bible that Mary gives a command. And what is it? Whatever Jesus says, do it. You'll find an interesting contrast in the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Anyway, so she says to the servants, whatsoever he saith to you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, what's the manner of purifying of the Jews? We just talked about it in the last episode. The mikvah, the ritual cleansing, the washing, these stone pots had been purified. And by the way, stone is something that you can use rabbinically, according to the Levitical law, that does not pass uncleanness from one thing to another. And it's containing two or three firkins apiece. What in the world does that mean? A firkin is about nine gallons. So these stone water pots each contained about 18 to 27 gallons of water. And Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. Somebody that would be in charge of the wedding. Like the wedding planner. Or something like that. He was not the superintendent of the guests, but rather the culinary aspect of the feast. He was kind of like the head chef. This could have been a friend of the family, or the one who supplied the location. His job was to taste the food and the drink. And it says in verse 9, When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. He didn't know where it came from. But the servants which drew the water, they knew. And in the process of the water being brought out of the water pot, it was transformed miraculously through the power of Jesus into wine. And it says the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, So he didn't know where it was from, and he calls for the groom. And he saith unto him, verse 10, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. Why? Because people aren't drunk yet, okay? Um, They are able to ascertain the quality of the wine that's there. And so usually they put the good stuff out first. And then afterward, it says in verse 10, And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. Then they'll put out the cheap stuff because they can't really they can't really tell that it's not good wine anyway. And he says, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. 
it's somewhat of a, a witty statement made by, the, made by the ruler of the feast. When a feast such as this begins, the best, most expensive wine is put out first. But when people are drunken, a cheaper, more diluted wine is used. This is a way to save cost and wouldn't be noticed by those that, to borrow a biblical phrase, tarry long at the wine. Verse 11 says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Remember, Jesus' disciples were there too. So the question comes out, Dan, was the wine that Jesus made at the wedding feast at Cana, was it alcoholic wine? I'll tell you this much, the Bible does not say. We cannot read into the scripture things that aren't explicitly there. Like I said earlier, the word for wine can mean alcoholic wine, or it can mean grape juice. All that we find from the statements made by the ruler is that the wine that Jesus made was really good. It was probably the best wine he'd ever taste in his entire life. But it does not say whether the wine that Jesus made was alcoholic or not. And it certainly was not like the biblical strong drink, which most of our modern alcoholic beverages today are classified as. Verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Meaning they were there for a little bit. We find in this verse that Jesus had brethren. There's other passages in the Bible that talk about how Jesus had brothers and sisters. One of his brothers was a guy named James, who eventually became the pastor at the church in Jerusalem. And so, yes, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. We read that after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph came together physically and had other children. Now we come to the first Passover feast in verse 13 of John chapter 2. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. Now, why why does it say the Jews' Passover? Is this some kind of an us versus them mentality? No, there's two reasons. First of all, the book of John is written to a worldwide audience, an audience that is not solely Jewish in ethnicity. So that's why he has to interpret words like rabbi and messiah. Because the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, when they would read these things, they would be like, what? What is that word? They wouldn't understand it. So when John says here that Passover was a feast of the Jews, it was a feast of the Jewish people. In contrast to the rest of the world. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Why? Because it was a pilgrimage feast of the Jews. Jesus was fulfilling that aspect of going to Jerusalem for the Passover. Verse 14, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. This is not something that was supposed to have occurred, according to the word of God. The temple was not to be a place where constant merchandising and monetary transactions were to be made. There was, by necessity, the need to change currency so that sacrifices could be bought and sold, but it was not to be done within the temple grounds. But Jesus sees them there, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money, and when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said to them that sold doves, Take these things hence, get these things out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's in reference to an Old Testament passage. It seems that the officers whose province it was to take care of the temple, permitted a market of these animals. 
and other things necessary for sacrifice to be kept in the court of the Gentiles, in order that the worshipers might be supplied with the victims requisite for the altar, the sacrifices. The consequence of which was that there was often such a bustle and confusion there that the proselytes, those that became worshipers of the God of Israel, could not do it without being very disturbed in their devotions. But the abuse didn't stop there, for it's generally supposed that the priests let out this part of the temple for profit, and that the sellers to him enable themselves to pay the rent of their shops and stalls, demanded an exorbitant price for their commodities, meaning there's like rental agreements being made and profit being had by marketing and merchandising the worship in the temple. It had been said that some of the priests and Levites very often sold the animals that they had received for sacrifices to the dealers in cattle at a lower rate that they might sell them again with profit, so that the same sacrifices were often sold to different persons without being sacrificed. You see, this was a cheat that was happening here. It was a scam. They were selling animals. The, per- the person would then take the animal to the, to the Levites or the priest, and then that animal would be resold to somebody else without being sacrificed. And the spoils or the gain of them were divided between the priests and the salesmen. In order to expedite this traffic, there were money changers at hand who gave the Jews who came from foreign countries the currency money of Judea instead of the money of the countries from where they came. And for this service, they took a premium, which upon the whole became very considerable. They were making lots of money off of this practice. Thus, the temple was profaned by the priests and literally made a den of thieves. When our Lord viewed this scene of iniquity, We don't need to wonder why he became so righteously angry. That's from the Benson Commentary. And then in verses 18 through 22, we have a prophecy of Jesus' resurrection. In verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Now, here again, everybody's Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. His followers are Jewish. The worshipers are Jewish. The priests are Jewish. Here it's talking specifically about the Judean religious leadership. What sign do you show us? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Are you going to destroy all of this and then build it again in just three days? But Jesus wasn't speaking about that temple. It says in verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. This is foreshadowing his resurrection. When therefore he was risen from the dead, speaking in hindsight here, John is giving us some insight into what happened after Jesus rose from the dead. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was at Jerusalem in the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So basically, we end this chapter with Jesus in Jerusalem at the Passover. We read that he was doing miracles that aren't recorded for us here in this passage. But it says many believed on him because of the miracles which they saw. But Jesus didn't totally commit himself into their hands, meaning go ahead and propagate what I'm doing and tell others. Jesus didn't want to do that yet because he knew what man is naturally like, what our natural tendencies are, to look out for ourselves and to try and see what's in it for us when we start getting attention from something that is successful. And so Jesus holds off still on publicly shouting from the rooftops about his Messiahship. In our next episode, we'll look at John chapter three. We'll see you then. Thank you so much for listening to the New to Jesus podcast. 
you can go to our website, newtojesus.com. That's new, the number two, jesus.com. If you'd like to find me on social media, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at danielbergman99. And if you'd like to rate and review this podcast on iTunes, that helps us to get in front of more people to help them take their first steps as new believers in Jesus.